so some of you, am I, yeah, so some of you are aware because you've come to me each week and said, that is a hideous sweater you wore today. And then I said to every one of you that said that to me, wait till the last Sunday. Well, you know, this is the last Sunday, so, and this is it. So, but, uh, but anyhow, um, is, hey, is Roxon here? Because I, I should thank Roxon. Is Roxon here somewhere? All right, I, I just want you to see, here, Roxon, stand up for a second. Stand up for a second, Roxon. So she is actually, uh, I, I don't know that she wants to be completely identified with all the sweaters that I wore this month. But, uh, but anyhow, thanks, and, uh, and she actually does some incredible work, so see her for your, like, like serious stuff, so, but good, good. But listen, I don't want this to be distracting, okay? So put it out of your mind, because we have a very serious message, just, uh, message this morning, so don't let this distract you, because we really have a great, a great message this morning from the scripture, so put it out of your mind. But you know, one of the reasons we've been wearing ugly Christmas sweaters is because our sermons for the past month has been about the ugly side of Christmas. And we just wanted a way for it to resonate with you, a way for you to go, oh man, I remember what it is that, uh, that we talked about. And so, so, you know, visuals help us with that. So another thing you'd learned about your pastor is that uh, he'll go to any extent for, uh, he'll do anything. He has no self-respect and all sorts of other things, but, uh, but nevertheless... But we've been talking about the ugly side of Christmas. And, uh, and it's been tough for us to put the word ugly with Christmas. And mainly because Christmas is such a beautiful time for us. It's when we focus on the reality of who Jesus is and, the, and, and, and that he came for us. And, 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 and Emmanuel, God with us. It's just a powerful and, and beautiful message. And so, so Christmas has been, uh, been a time for us that we embrace and that we enjoy and that, that we concentrate on how God cares about us. But, you know, the reality is, is we whitewash a lot of the story. We take a lot of the story of Christmas and we either kind of move it aside or we just, or we just shift it just enough so perhaps we don't see the full impact of it. So, so for instance, um, you know, all of our nativity scenes are, are whitewashed, right? All of our nativity scenes are. And I don't know if you put a nativity scene up at home or not, but, but I grew up with a nativity scene. And, and, you know, mom would put it out every year, you know, and it would be out for, for weeks. And, and one of the whitewashed figures in this nativity scene is, is the shepherds. You know, they're, they're whitewashed. And because you look at a shepherd in the nativity scene and you think, wow, how comforting, how caring, how, how wonderful and protective those shepherds are. And in fact, in the nativity scene that, that, that we had growing up, we even had one shepherd where the lamb was over their shoulders and they were carrying the lamb. And you would see that image and it would make you think, wow. I mean, I mean here the heavenly host opened up and the angels sang and, and they said, God's born in Bethlehem. And, and, and this shepherd couldn't even leave this lamb, couldn't abandon this lamb for a minute so grabbed the lamb and, and took the lamb with them, uh, you know, all the way to the manger scene. And you think, wow, how, how, how meaningful, how, how warm that makes you feel. And, and I get it, right? You get it. You get where we get our popular image of, of the shepherd. Be, because the scriptures as a whole, the general portrayal of, of shepherds in the scripture, it, they are warm. And, and, and they are comforting and they are protective. Like, for instance, you know, in the scriptures, great men in the scriptures are listed as shepherds. Abraham was listed as a shepherd. Moses was a shepherd. Uh, David was a shepherd. And, and in fact, how many stories do we have of David, right? Where you hear about David, where he, where he like puts himself between the lamb and, and the bear. And he fights off the bear and he fights off the lion to protect the sheep. And, and so there's this sense of, of this portrayal of who a shepherd is. In fact, when, when, when David became king, it talks about in the Psalms how he is supposed to use his shepherding heart and skills as king. Psalm 78 says this, He chose David his servant, and he took him from the sheep pens. From tending the sheep he brought him to be the shepherd of his people Jacob, of Israel his inheritance. And David shepherded them with the integrity of heart, with skillful hands, he led them. So, I mean, this whole idea of shepherding was, was like, was this, was this warm sense and feeling, right? And the 23rd Psalm, 
Who doesn't know the opening line to the 23rd Psalm and the whole feel of the 23rd Psalm? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. I, I, I lack nothing because God provides for me and he takes care of me and he, and he leads me. And, 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 and there's this sense of who a shepherd is. That, and, and in fact, in the New Testament, when we jump to the New Testament, Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd in John 10. He says, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then the kind of round out like all of the New Testament. You even get into the epistles. And Peter uses the imagery of shepherding again as he calls the elders to the church to fulfill their responsibility. And he says this in 1 Peter 5. Be shepherds of God's flock that's under your care. Watching over them not because you must but because you're willing as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. So, I mean, right, we, we get the idea of, of, of shepherding, the, the, the image of a shepherd that the scripture really from, from almost beginning to end like, like displays for us. But, but that image in the scripture, that general portrayal of, of shepherds in the scripture is, is not representative of the shepherds in the nativity scene. I mean, we would really be be dishonest with ourselves if we thought that the shepherds in our nativity scenes, the time of the birth of Christ, if we thought they were like the same people that, that Abraham, Moses, and David were. And I get it. Luke 2, 8, right? Luke 2, 8 says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. But, but you even know that, that idea of their flocks? Their flocks didn't denote ownership. Because they weren't the owners of the sheep. It just, it just meant they were the ones hired to be responsible for the sheep at the time. And, and all the shepherds that we think of, when we think of them as kind and gentle and caring, you know, the, 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 the Abraham, the Moses, the David. I mean, I mean, their motivation came out of their heart. Probably not so much for the shepherds in the nativity scene at the time of Jesus' birth. You know, the job of the shepherd had fallen quite a bit. I mean, it had fallen from this high status and it had, had like almost dropped off a cliff to where it stood by the time Jesus was born. I mean, gone are the days of David spinning his sling and, and, and literally protecting the lambs from the lion and the bear. In fact, it had gotten so bad that when Jesus called himself the good shepherd, he had to draw a line of distinction between the people's understanding of a shepherd in that day. Yeah, he had to say, hey, I'm the good shepherd. Oh, oh, by the way, I don't mean the shepherd you're used to. And here's what he says in John 10. Because, because right before this, right before he says this, he names himself the good shepherd. And then listen to what he says. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and he runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and it scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and he cares nothing for the sheep. So, the, so really the, the shepherds of the nativity scene, I mean, they would, they would much rather slit the throat of the lamb, cook it up over the fire, and tell the owner that a wolf ran away with it. They would much rather do that than carry any lamb around in loving protection. It's true. I mean, it's really true. The shepherds of Jesus' day, I mean, it's changed. They were now known, by the time Jesus was born, they were known as dishonest, self-interested thieves who were only out for themselves. That really was, that really was the portrayal of a shepherd in that day. The lowest level of occupation filled by the lowest level of society. Do you know it had gotten so bad that, that shepherds were not even allowed to testify in court? Like, like if, you were, if you were in court and, 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 and something had happened and the only other person that had seen it was a shepherd, do you know you could not call the shepherd as a witness to verify what you were saying? Because the whole society and the court system himself looked at shepherds and said, they're not honest. They're, they're, no, they cannot testify. They are not a valid testimony in the court of law. And that's how dishonest they were viewed as. And and I know, right, you think about it and you think, man, shepherds were up here and, and then all of a sudden now they're way down here and, and why? I mean, I, mean, I mean, why did this happen, right? I mean, who could figure it out? Well, I, I don't know, but, but, but maybe, 
Maybe the old-fashioned shepherds. You know, the one that kept their small flock and tended their own sheep and cared about them and took care of them. Maybe the old-fashioned shepherd, maybe they grew into ranchers where their, where their flocks grew and, 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 and they were worried about the mass that they could produce. And, and maybe they only came by every once in a while to inspect the flock. I mean, maybe the wool industry or the, or the meat industry or, or the sacrifice industry had, had really become about mass production. And so now these, now these rancher shepherds wanted to like, wanted to, to drive up ever increasing profits. So, so, so like thinking about how do I drive up profits, maybe the ranch shepherds, maybe what they did is, is, is as they increased their flock, maybe what they did is they drove down the wages of their hired hands so they could keep more in their own pocket. I mean, maybe they made the wages so low that the only people who could really take the job were were desperate workers. And maybe, maybe the reason that they stole the sheep is because they couldn't afford to eat on the wages that they were paid. Now, I want to set the record straight because I don't want us to be confused about, uh, like I don't want to make the, the shepherds into like ancient Near East Robin Hoods because they were not that. They didn't rob from the rich to give to the poor. They robbed from the rich to have themselves. And I mean, that really was a story. And, 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 and I don't want to excuse bad behavior, right? Because bad behavior is bad behavior. If you steal, you're a thief. But, but I do want to say that, that there may be more to this story than, than, than at first glance. I mean, there may be another side to all of this. Uh, like, for instance, I know that the shepherds of their day were social outcasts. They were social outcasts for way more than how they conducted themselves in the field. Did you know that shepherds in their day, in this day, could not attend religious ceremonies? They couldn't go to a religious ceremony. And if you, and if you didn't go to synagogue or if you didn't go to, to temple at the times of worship and you were a Jew, you were an outcast. Because that's just the way it was. It was a part of your culture. It was a part of who you were. And, and if you didn't celebrate these things, and if you weren't regular to these places, then you were considered an outcast. And, and you know, there's some obvious reasons why they couldn't, right? Like, like, like one obvious reason is that uh, is they could never leave the flock alone, right? A, a flock always needs shepherds to tend it. So they could never, like, leave the flocks on their own. And, and they had to be there all the time. So, I mean, they had a good reason. They had to work. That's why they couldn't, like, attend the religious services. But at the same time, uh, as a shepherd, they, they would have to travel with their sheep sometimes to get them to places to where they could feed. Like, sometimes they had to go higher up in the mountains to, you know, to, 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 to find the grass. Sometimes they had to move the flock to where they, could, where they could eat. And sometimes they would move far enough away from home that, I mean, it wasn't convenient even to get home. So, so like, sometimes they spent weeks and months in the field without bathing. And, 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 and then when they didn't bathe, what would happen is the priest would declare them unclean because they, because they didn't bathe. And, 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 and so there's this whole context of, of a shepherd. And, and, and to, really, like, to really add some spice to the story, like the temple in Jerusalem, the temple in Jerusalem, it's known that they would keep their flocks in the hills of Bethlehem. So... So the actual shepherds that showed up when Jesus was born that are in our nativity scene, there's a high probability they were the shepherds that took care of the temple's flock. And, and, and I think how, think how uncomfortable those moments used to be, right? Like, just think about this. Think about how uncomfortable it must be when, when shepherds employed by the priest in the temple have to deliver the sheep to the priest, I mean, it has to be an incredibly uncomfortable moment because, you know, here comes a shepherd and here comes a pen of sheep and, and the shepherds come up and the priest can't touch them, right? Because they're unclean. And if the priest would touch the, touch the shepherd, then they would be declared unclean. So they can't touch them. So, I mean, they can't say, hey, how's it going? They can't give them a hug. Long time no see. They can't shake their hand. They can't smack them on the shoulder. I mean, they can't interact with them like, like, like other people could interact. Nobody could because they're, they're unclean. And, and, and so imagine, imagine how you even get your paycheck, right? Like how you get your paycheck and it wouldn't be a, a check, of course, in those days. But, but it's not like they could take the coin and, and put it in your hand because they can't touch you. 
So, right, they set the money down someplace, and then you come to get the money, and they drop it on the ground, and you go over to the ground to pick it up after they leave. But, but I mean, there has to be some incredibly tense moments and awkward moments in, in these interactions. And, and I don't know this, but, 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 but I think this. I, I think, do you ever think that maybe the shepherds had some insecurities because of all of this? Now, I know they wouldn't call them insecurities, right? Not in that day. They wouldn't say, oh, the shepherds are insecure because nobody had a psychology degree and there weren't counselors everywhere. And so, so I mean, they, you know, they wouldn't name it that, right? But, I mean, emotions are emotions and people are people. I mean, you can open your Bible and you can read about emotions all through the Scripture. So, right, these shepherds, I mean, I mean right, they, they have to have a certain level of emotion, Right in their interactions with people, they, they have to feel things and, and respond to things. So, so do you think, do you think that, that, that their personal defense mechanisms ever riled up when they had to see the priest? Like, do you think that they're, they, they were just like defensive when it was like, when the time came? Do you think they began to like avoid upstanding citizens because of the awkward stares they would get? Do you think as an 18-year-old or 19-year-old shepherd, this, this young, good-looking, strapping kid, when he came into town and every, every family would take their daughter and move them to the other side so that they couldn't be near you? Do you think that would do something to you? And I don't, right, I don't know this, right? I'm just thinking about, like, the impact on, on, on the shepherds and, and their mindset. But, but, but would, it be, would it be in the realm of possibilities that this rough, tough, thieving exterior was an exterior? I mean, that it was, it was like an exterior that, 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 that they wore, you know, that they just adopted and said, okay, I'm going to wear this because, because of how painful normal activity would be for them. That, that maybe deep down inside, they had a boatload of insecurities. And, and you know where insecurities come from, right? I mean, you, you know one of the number one things that causes insecurities in people? Rejection. Rejection is like king of insecurity. When, when somebody feels rejected, you felt rejected before, and, and how did it make you feel? Right? I mean, something happens to you when you, when, when you, when you, when you, when you feel this rejection, when, when people reject you, and they live with it. Social anxiety and some other things, right, they create, create this, uh, this, these insecurities. But, but last time I read the story, last time I understood that, that what these shepherds would go through and how they would live, I would look and say, man, they have every reason in the world to be insecure if this is what creates insecurities. But... But besides that, right, besides the shepherds, right, what they were thinking or what they were feeling or what they were going through or maybe who they were, the big day arrives. You know what I mean when I say big day, right? The big day arrives. I mean, it's the big day. It, the, the, the day that Jesus is born, the, the day that Emmanuel's here, God in the flesh, it's the big day. And the heavenly choir, they've been practicing, they've been practicing since Genesis chapter 3. And you know where Genesis falls in your Bible? It's the first book. So right there, you got one chapter, you got two chapters. By the third chapter comes the fall of man. And then God promises that Jesus is coming. So all of heaven knows Jesus is coming. There's a big day when, when, when man, Jesus is going to go down there and he's going to enter this world. And, and, man, that day's coming. So, man, the heavenly choir, they've been practicing since Genesis chapter 3. And now we're all the way into Luke. I mean, that's a lot of time. They've been practicing and preparing to sing. And then all of a sudden, man, whoom, the sky's open. And, and, and then, then the curtains are rolled back. And, and like, and like the, the host of heaven is visible to human eyes. And the audience, the only human eyes, are eight insecure, underpaid, thieving migrant workers. Seriously? I mean, we've been practicing for how long? I mean, why? Why is that the case? Now, 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 just imagine with me, all right? Just imagine with me for a second that, that you're a part of the most sophisticated choir ever put together. I mean, man, you have, you have one of the greatest voices ever made. And so does everybody else in your choir. 
And you get together and you practice. And you're practicing for one concert. And I don't mean you're not practicing for three months or, or six months, man. You're practicing for decades, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years for this one single performance that's going to shake the world. And you practice and you invest yourself in it and you're excited about it. And then all of a sudden, man, the curtains pulled back and the only people that your pastor invited is a homeless guy, a local prostitute, and someone who just got out of prison for selling drugs to children. And you're like, what? You'd have something to say about that, wouldn't you? You would. I mean, you'd have something to say about that. You'd be like, whoa, what, what in the world just happened? Man, we've been practicing for decades. This, this concert was going to impact the world. And then all of a sudden, this is who you invite. So this is the audience. You better believe you'd have something to say about that. And because you would, it would say something about us. Because we would have something to say about the audience. It would say something about us. But, but, but it would also, right, this audience would also say something about God. Like who showed up and who the audience was, it would communicate something to us about, about who God is. Like, like why this audience? Well, you guys have been around church enough, right? You've read enough about the scriptures and you know enough. You've had enough Sunday school lessons and small group times and sermons that, that the obvious answer is everyone is welcome at the manger, right? And, and so, so when the curtains pulled back and the heavenly host is singing and the, here these shepherds are, well, my, my, it communicates something about who God is. It communicates something about his grace and his love and his acceptance. I mean, it means that he came to seek and to save the lost. And he wasn't kidding. He wasn't kidding. He didn't just say it. It wasn't a tagline. He meant it. He's there to seek and to save the lost. And so when the curtains roll back, who's there? Who's there? The lost. And I believe absolutely that God wants us to know, uh, God wants us to know that he cares and he loves and he wants everybody to bow their knee to the Savior. But I also think, I also think this whole story, it communicates something about you and me. Because we would have something to say about the audience. I think it communicates something about you and me. And here's what I think it communicates about us. And we forget it sometimes. But in spite of the fact that we wake up every morning and we want to put on the wise men clothes, we want to put on the fancy outfits and the tall hats and, the, and we want to present ourselves a certain way. What this says is that in spite of the fact that we put on the wise men clothes, deep down inside, we're those shepherds. And if we would remove the facades, if we would remove the facade of education, if we would remove the facade of income, if we would remove the facade of style, if we'd remove the facade of ethnicity, if we'd remove the facade of politics, if we'd remove the facade of what car we drive, if we'd remove the facade of what neighborhood we live in, if we would remove the facade of you name it, deep down inside, we are a lot like those shepherds. We are the insecure underpaid, well, maybe not where we live, thieving migrant workers on God's ranch. That's who we are. I mean, we are the, we are the insecure, thieving migrant workers on God's ranch. And I know deep down inside, we're like, whoa, whoa, I don't know that I accept that. I don't know. I don't know if I'm really, do I need to ask anyone here if they've ever sinned? Do, do I need to do that? Do I need to say, hey, have you ever sinned? Do I need to ask you, have you ever stolen from God? Of course you have. Because if you've ever not tithed according to God's word, you've stolen from him. Right? And I mean, man, so you look at it and say, I don't have to, I don't have to ask if you've stolen from God. I, I don't have to ask you, have you ever gone your own way and ignored God? I don't have to ask you that. Of course you have. Right? I mean, the scripture tells us every single one of us has, but you know times in your life when you've done it, 
When you've known that God has wanted you to move one direction and you've gone another. That you didn't go the way he wanted you to. I, I know it. I don't have to ask you if you have insecurities. Of course you have insecurities. We all have insecurities in life. All of us do. In fact, even the Apostle Paul reminds us of that, right? He reminds the Corinthian church, in, in which we use today to remind ourselves, right? Where he says this, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were, were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you're in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, our holiness, and our redemption. Therefore, as it is written, and you know why Paul says as it is written, because he wants you to know he didn't make it up. He's not the first one to say it. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Not, you're probably saying, hey, pastor, thanks for that great message of good news. What are you trying to depress me? You just want us all to feel bad about who we are and, 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 and the role we play in this world and in life. It's just like trying to make us feel bad, depress us, put us all in our place. Oh, my. No way. You, 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 know, you know why we have to know this and you know how, why we have to embrace this? Because it reminds us. It reminds us of the great hope that we have that's not found in ourselves. It's not found in our own skill set. It's not found in, 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 in what we think we can produce. Man, we have this incredible hope and it's only found in Christ. That's the only place it's found. And, 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 and man, it reminds us of, of the reality of our position in relationship with him. Because, because you're not lowly in comparison to each other. I mean, you're not weak in comparison to each other. No, you're not, man. Man, you're, 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 you're weak and lowly in comparison to who God is. And understanding that relationship is absolutely vital to be able to thrive in relationship with who he is. I mean, we talk about this because, because it, it brings to mind God's incredible love for us. It brings to mind his power to transform us. It brings to mind his Holy Spirit that can be at work within us. I mean, we, we talk about this not because we, we put ourselves down, but because we elevate who Jesus is. That's why we talk about it. That's why we embrace it. And we share these thoughts so that we might be motivated just like the original shepherds. Motivated to place our eyes fully on Jesus and to be able to tell the world, to be able to overcome whatever our issues are and whatever our insecurities are and be able to tell the world, Emmanuel is here. He's come. He's here. And, and we do this. We do this to offer once again to anyone who's ready to admit. Man, we do this so that we can offer to anyone who's ready to admit that underneath it all, you're a shepherd in this story. The story of freedom, the story of grace, the story of God who wraps himself in flesh to come after you because he loves you that much. So, man, we, we, we tell this story and we remind ourselves of, of where we were when we did not know him when we did not walk in his light, when we had not received his grace, when we had not professed him as savior. I mean, we remind ourselves, right? Man, we remind ourselves because, because it inspires us to tell the world he's come and it allows us to offer that hope to others and to say, man, our God loves you. He loves you. And there's a possibility. There is a reality for forgiveness and purpose and hope and transformation that comes only through him. Healing and hope. So, so this morning, this morning, this is, this is what I want to do this morning. I want to give anybody here who would say, hey, pastor, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I've ever like really professed 
Jesus is my Savior. I don't know that I've ever, I mean, I've hung around God a lot and, you know, done the church thing and, and, and kind of believed, but I don't know that I've ever really said, hey, man, I am a sinner and I need a Savior. It, you know, admitting that we're sinners is like essential to salvation. It, it, in fact, we call it, right, the confession of sin, that we confess, I'm a sinner and that I need a Savior. But because if we don't confess sin, here's the truth, if we don't confess sin, then we don't need any forgiveness. But the truth is, is every one of us, right, we've fallen, right, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And confession is so incredibly important in that journey to receive God's powerful grace, effective to change our eternity, and His Holy Spirit to begin to transform us here and now. So this morning, I, I just want to give you a chance. If you're here and you say, man, I've never, I think I've ever... I, I made that decision. I want to. I want you to. I want you to know that you know that you know. And, and so this morning, I just want to sort of give you an opportunity to pray. And, and I'm going to say a prayer. And in my prayer, I'm going to talk about right that I believe who Jesus is. That I'm a sinner and that I I need a savior. That I know that what He did on the cross is sufficient for my salvation. And in this moment, I, you know that I'm, I'm going to receive. I'm going to like, I'm going to turn from my own thoughts and, and, and turn to His. But, but in this moment, I'm going to receive the grace that He extends to us. So, so I'm going to pray, and, and you can you can use my words, but but the truth is, is you just really need to meet it in your heart. Share your own words. Everybody, if you bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment. Jesus, I believe that you are who you say you are. I believe that you're the Savior of the world. And I believe that you're the Son of God and that, that, on, that on that day of your birth that, that you were wrapped in flesh Lord, I, I believe that you died on the cross, that the shedding of your blood covers and cleanses. And Lord, I praise you for that. And Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner and that I need a Savior. And right here and right now, I just want to acknowledge. I just want to profess that you're my Savior and you're my Lord. So in this moment, I receive the incredible gift that you offer me in, in, in changing my eternal destiny. All that heaven has to offer. And at the same time, at the same time, Jesus, I revel in the fact that you, that you place your spirit in my heart to begin this transformational journey in me. So Lord, man, with the help of your spirit, with the help of your grace, I, I turn from my own thoughts and I embrace you and, and your thoughts and your way. Work in me, O oh Lord, your grace and your majesty, your purpose. Lord, I praise you for your goodness and your grace. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Now, now if you prayed that prayer this morning, do, do me a favor. In your program, there's a card, a prayer request card, and, and, and in the corner it says, I pray to accept Christ. If you prayed that prayer today, would you would you check that? And the ushers are getting ready to, to come down and receive the offering this morning, and you can take that card and place it in the basket. And, and we just want to have an opportunity to, to celebrate with you. We want to have an opportunity to, to talk about, uh, you know, how we live as followers of Jesus and, and just have an opportunity to, to, like, partner with you in this journey. So, so if you do that, that would be a wonderful thing. So let's pray together. Jesus, thank you. Thank you. We know you as Jehovah Jireh, as the God who provides in so many wonderful things. So Lord, this morning, Lord, I pray that you would find us faithful. I pray, Jesus, that you would continue your deep work within us. And Lord, I pray that this Christmas we would celebrate who you are like never before. We love you, Jesus, and we praise you in your name. Amen.